far in Australia. Um, it's very much my pleasure today to chat to you about my recent research into federal decision making and in particular section 74A of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. I began this research as part of a task for the Adelaide EDO, uh, as Hannah mentioned. I've been volunteering there for a bit over a year um, and I was looking into some decisions around the Olympic Dam mining development in South Australia, which I'll get into a little bit later on. But what I stumbled upon uh, was Section 74A of the EPBC Act, and this gives the Minister discretion. And this discretion seems to exist to allow for better regulatory standards and environmental protection. The only thing was this discretion had never been used. And what I found was there have clearly been appropriate opportunities for this section and, and this discretion to be exercised, uh, especially in Olympic Dam, as you'll see, and this left me thinking about broader decision-making frameworks in the EPBC as a whole. Uh, so today I'll be taking you through my research paper for those who haven't read it, uh, but as briefly as I can for those who have, I definitely won't take up the full hour. Um, it should only take about half. Uh, and I'll do this by starting with an explanation of Earth jurisprudence theory. And this is a theoretical perspective uh, I analyze the legislation from. And it's where I'm generally approaching these issues from. I'll then get into the nitty gritty and the legislation and I'll discuss uh, section 74A and its context in the approval and assessment system, whether there's a duty to consider it, uh, what the scope of that consideration might be. Uh, so hopefully you can stick with me through the technical stuff. Uh, it should only take about five minutes or so uh, because then I'll basically rip into it and discuss the issues that arise when we look at it all at once. Uh, we'll look at how it's been utilised or not utilised in practice in two quick case studies, one of which being the Olympic Dam, and then I'll get into my recommendations for reform for Section 74A and decision making under the Act more generally. And then I'll lastly touch on the independent review of the EPBC Act uh, and whether the final report of that review had anything to say about these issues. Spoiler alert, it didn't have a lot to say, uh, at least in regard to 74A. Uh, but I'll also go through how that report will hopefully shape decision-making frameworks moving forward uh, by looking at what the government's recent response has been. Oops. So Earth Jurisprudence Theory. Uh, it was developed by a man named Thomas Berry in the early 2000s, uh, who was a cultural historian. I think he was in his 80s or 90s when he coined the term. Uh, and what the theory does is diverge from a human-centered perspective by drawing the human out of the center and putting it on a level playing field uh, with the whole of the earth community, as you can sort of see by this diagram over here. It's not opposite to anthropocentrism as it doesn't replace the human with the environment at the center or the top, uh, according to the diagram, um, as a maybe more strict ecocentric view might. Uh, so it's based on the principle of earth community. And in other words, what this is, is essentially an acknowledgement that humans are interconnected with nature and that nat and the natural world does not exist for human use and exploitation. Put simply, humans are not separate to or superior to Earth. And I interpret this theory as a kind of soft ecocentrism, and I'm a big believer in it, as in my opinion, I think it's the most suitable entry point for an ecocentric shift uh, or a diminishment of anthropocentrism. I consider myself a bit of a realist and in my opinion, uh, I don't see a paradigm shift away from anthropocentrism, capitalism, neoliberalism, principles of perpetual economic growth and financial profitability happening anytime soon in the world we live in. And as we know, it's very difficult to protect the environment when our environmental governance in this country is based on these anthropocentric notions. But I certainly think regard for the environment is gaining momentum and change is coming slowly. The reason I believe Earth jurisprudence is an appropriate theory is because it doesn't demand an overhaul of the legal system, just a shift in thinking. And this shift is stepping away from that idea that humans and the world around them are separate and that humans are superior. This shift requires current lawmakers in the current process uh, to formulate laws consistent with the integrity of nature 
as a limit for human law. And what this means to me is lawmaking uh, with environmental ideals at the core of decision making, as opposed to lawmaking purely for human benefit and then slapping some environmental related regulations on afterward to try and limit our damage. It simply requires the acceptance that nature has intrinsic value uh, and that it doesn't exist just to serve us, uh, which is an acceptance that doesn't have to mean that the human loses its moral status. Uh, this is because we're all part of the earth community. Uh, we are not now underneath the environment. So when thinking about lawmaking, the flourishing of this community should be at the forefront of minds uh, and thought of as a prerequisite for human existence, not as an afterthought. So as you can see, this theory doesn't particularly align with the EPBC Act and the assessment and approval system, as these laws are formulated from these neoliberalist and capitalist perspectives. The system in the legislation exists to reject projects only if they have a significant impact on certain matters of national environmental significance. And sometimes this doesn't even happen because as I'll show you shortly, the decision-making in this space, perhaps unsurprisingly, seems to have developed a bias toward approval. Now coming right back to 74A, um, I'll start by explaining a little background and where it fits into the assessment and approval system in the Act. So before formal assessment, uh, which you can see down in the bottom left here, in this very basic chart I did up, um, the first step in the process is a referral. Um, and it's where someone will refer a development or a project. If there's any possibility, it will have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance. And this gives the minister a decision to make on whether the action needs assessment. It's essentially a screening process where the minister will either decide uh, the referral is a controlled action uh, and it needs assessment because it's likely to have a significant impact or not a controlled action because it's unlikely to have a significant impact or it's exempt. And what can happen in this referral process is what's called a split referral where someone submits multiple referrals for different parts of one large project. These can benefit a developer by allowing the more practical and efficient sequencing or structuring of a project. However, on the flip side, um, it can also present environmental risk at the referral stage, as it has the potential to diminish the integrity of the assessment. And this is where section 74A fits in, as you can tell by my crudely drawn arrow. And it gives the minister the discretionary power to reject a split referral if it is likely to promote the objects of the EPBC Act. Now, for those of you who are quite familiar with the Act, uh, you might know these objects can present more problems than they help to solve. And I'll touch on this in some more detail shortly. So while the EPBC Act doesn't state whether 74A must be considered by a minister, uh, the case of the Wilderness Society of Tasmania and the Minister for the Environment explored this issue in the federal court in 2019. And while the, while the judgment didn't definitively answer the question, uh, it concluded 74A must be considered if there is a real, not fanciful basis for its engagement. And this appears to be when a referral is a component of a large action or there are future stages of a development not included in the referral. So essentially, if it's a split referral, the minister must consider 74A. Uh, and this was said by the court to be the whole purpose of 74A. Makes sense. But what does the minister actually have to consider? What is the scope of 74A? Well, as you'll see, the discretion allows for basically any outcome to be reached. And this is where I'll come back to the problematic object of the act. So 74A itself simply states the minister may decide to reject a referral if it's a component of a larger action. The explanatory material then provides the key question the minister considers, which you can see here, whether the splitting of the project reduces the ability to achieve the object of the act. It also provides four main considerations for the minister when answering the key question, which you can see underneath, and I'll just run through these. Uh, so can impacts only be assessed through consideration of the whole project? Uh, will split referrals result in the large action being effectively taken without the need 
for um, assessment. Is it preferable to assess and approve the large action as a whole and policy considerations, which is essentially how to best promote the objects of the act. The minister must make sure all the relevant impacts are adequately assessed uh, if choosing to accept split referrals. But again, what is relevant and what is adequate is not explained. Not only is there a lack of clarity, but even when there are appropriate circumstances to reject split referral, the explanatory material simply states it may be preferable to do this and doesn't oblige the minister to make this decision to reject the split referrals. 74A is sure starting to seem pretty hollow. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with two major issues. One is that the objects impose such a vague obligation on the minister, which is essentially impossible to define and to measure, meaning that when the minister is considering uh, whether to reject the split referral, he doesn't really have any concrete framework to go on uh, or any outcomes to try and achieve. And issue two is that the definition of impacts under the Act does not include cumulative impacts. So issue one, the objects, which include such things as to protect the environment, to promote ecologically sustainable development, and to conserve biodiversity, among other things. And these appear to appear to align with Earth's jurisprudence theory in that they principally value the environment. However, in practice, ESD throws a bit of a spanner in the works. The principles of ESD place importance on long-term consequences while demonstrating the inherent conflict and balance required between environmental and economic concerns. The thing is, decision makers are given no guidance on the practical implementation of ESD. So it must be hard to appropriately weigh factors when the term ecological integrity seen in principle four, has no definition or explanation. A lack of guidance leads to the individual discretion of the decision maker to weigh the principles of ESD, resulting in effectively unconstrained outcomes. And it is argued these outcomes have favoured development. Whether this is due to the entrenched beliefs of our economic system, having potential for infinite growth and being unhindered by nature, or whether it's just due to poor guidance and clarity, or both remains unanswered. What is clear is that the EPBC in practice comprises quite a polycentric decision-making framework uh, that's built on balance and environmental factors may not be prioritised. So impacts, the key question of what in this the key question of whether the splitting of the project reduces the ability to achieve the objects of the act is as mentioned, almost impossible to properly answer. The explanatory material points toward whether all impacts can be properly assessed if the referral is split. I argue this question is relatively moot without the proper evaluation of cumulative impacts. And these are the successive incremental and combined impacts, both positive and negative, uh, and their activities on society, the economy and the environment. The cumulative impacts may arise from a single activity, multiple activities, or from interactions with other current and foreseeable activities. Logically, there cannot be proper consideration of cumulative impacts of a whole project if components are reviewed independently in split referrals. Now, historically, the federal court has asserted cumulative impacts are not required to be considered. However, in the Rocky Hill case, I'm sure many of us are familiar with from 2019, Chief Justice Preston rejected the application for a new coal mine in New South Wales due to economic impacts being outweighed by the cumulative environmental impacts. And while the persuasiveness of the decision is limited due to its non-federal jurisdiction, I think it certainly has encouraging potential to change the future of cumulative impact consideration in Australian decision making. By defining cumulative impacts and incorporating the definition into his decision, I think Chief Justice Preston has coincidentally challenged the very nature of split referrals. Uh, it appears cumulative impacts will always be overlooked if assessing split referrals separately, and therefore there can never be proper assessment of all relevant impacts. The definition of a cumulative impact, as you can see, refers to impacts caused from interactions with other foreseeable activities 
which would include future plan stages of the project that's split into separate referrals. So following this rationale, if we go back to 74A, can impacts only be assessed through consideration of the whole project? Uh, well, the answer would be yes, almost always, because cumulative impacts can only be properly assessed through consideration of the whole project and not when it's separated into steps. And uh, on point three, is it preferable to assess and approve the large action as a whole? Again, almost always yes, unless part of the project referred separately produces no impacts whatsoever. So that basically sums up my long-winded explanation of 74A, I apologise. But now I'll move on to how it's been applied in practice. Now, there's been two ministerial decisions published with statements of reasons over the years, allowing some insight into the decision-making process. So firstly, in the case of Abbott Point, uh, the minister received a single referral for a capital dredging project, which related to future planned activities of more dredging and storage and such. And the referral was deemed a component of a large action and thus a split referral. He did not exercise his discretion to reject the referral, despite having a reasonable basis to do so, according to the explanatory material itself. This is because according to the material, total impacts can only be properly considered when all future stages of a planned activity are considered. But the minister obviously decided impacts were being properly considered in this case somehow. Uh, and in making the decision, uh, he seemed to divert from the four considerations I spoke about earlier. And the considerations he gave were quite different. Uh, he seemed to focus more on who was providing the referral and who would be completing the future stages of the project, which is a reasonable thing to wonder, but um, also not at all what Section 74A or the explanatory material asks the minister to consider. Now, before I get into the main split referral and the instigator for why I wrote this paper in the first place, I think it's just important to quickly note, um, this is not anti-mining or anti-nuclear rhetoric. I'm not saying this project should or shouldn't go ahead. Uh, that's a different conversation. I'm simply saying here that the process which occurred is deeply flawed. So in 2019, BHP submitted three related referrals, one for an evaporation pond, which is a very large artificial pond designed to evaporate water away from nuclear waste. It's not actually this little one here. It's, it's all these big ones back here. You can't really see. There's quite a few. Um, and another referral for a storage facility of nuclear waste and one for the mine expansion generally. Surprise, the minister did not exercise his discretion to reject the split referrals and even deemed the pond and the storage facility as not controlled meaning they don't require approval. And this is despite a recommendation from the Australian government in 2011 to regulate the entire Olympic Dam operation, including future expansions, like what's proposed here, under a single EPBC Act approval. This recommendation from 2011 came from a conditional approval of a different Olympic Dam expansion proposed at the time, uh, and that stated evaporation ponds are to be phased out as soon as practicable to reduce impacts on listed species of birds, which are a matter of national environmental significance. And this is because the birds might be migrating across SA or the desert and they see these huge water sources uh, and think, yeah, it's a good spot to rest and hydrate. Uh, so they come down and yeah, not water. The 2011 approval also stated storage facilities must undergo a comprehensive safety assessment, including an assessment of impacts posed for at least 10,000 years due to their extreme risk category. So whatever your views, it seems clear nuclear operations pose significant environmental impacts. So not only has the minister's decision gone against the government's own recommendations and conditions from eight years earlier, but the decision also cited BHP's efforts to publicise their proposals and account for all relevant impacts in their proposals as a reason for his Section 74A decision not to reject the split referrals. Uh, 
Relying on non-independent information provided by BHP is hardly the criteria contained in the explanatory material. Uh, I could go on as I do in the article about the particulars of the environmental impact risks, the pond and the storage facility and the development pose uh, on top of the birds. But I believe it is quite clear the approval of a new evaporation pond and storage facility without assessment is not consistent with the objects of the Act, particularly when a simple use of the 74 a discretion would result in all the actions being referred together and then undergoing formal assessment as a whole. So what I'm not saying here is that the mine expansion should be denied or Olympic Dam should be completely shut down or that the ponds or storage facilities are flat out unacceptable. I'm simply making the point the decision to reject the split referrals seemed a relatively easy one, which would then lead the mine expansion in its entirety to be properly assessed. The decision, to, the decision not to reject the split referrals that came last year appears to do the opposite of promoting protection of the environment and does not appear to be in the interests of conserving biodiversity especially of migratory and threatened bird species. Uh, the long-term risk of environmental impacts, a key consideration in ESD, seems to not have been appropriately balanced against the short-term economic benefit of the mine. Moving on to my recommendations, I don't propose to remove the framework completely as perhaps a strict ecocentric interpretation would, uh, because it can be argued that their very nature, split referrals are a product of anthropocentrism. But instead, I believe this soft ecocentric approach, as I like to call it, acknowledges the benefits of such a system to society. And instead, I propose to alter the decision making framework. I propose to increase scrutiny and hone discretion to shift the balance away from human based economic needs to earth based needs with environmental protection as the primary consideration. And this is because research has shown the social and economic values are more flexible and adaptable by virtue of being human-based, whereas environmental values are dependent on natural phenomena and are thus less adaptable and rely on a lack of human obstruction to flourish. By keeping the discretion, but altering the framework behind it, the system that benefits humans can continue in this aspect, but never at the cost of unnecessary environmental harm. While my article and its recommendations were released before Professor Graham Samuel's final report of the EPBC Act review, uh, which came out late last year, um, I will discuss my recommendations today in context of the outcomes of that final report. So I recommended two methods for reform to effectively regulate the split referral system and limit environmental harm. One was to retain the key question of whether a split referral is inconsistent with EPBC objects, uh, but then amend the objects themselves. Uh, or option two was to amend that key question. Now, the latter simply requires lawmakers to alter, reduce, or remove the discretion. And I recommended the key question should be restructured to be consistent with the Rocky Hill case judgment and include cumulative impacts, meaning the discretion would read something along the lines of, does the splitting of the project allow proper consideration of cumulative environmental impacts? This would result in split referrals only being accepted where a component of an action produces effectively no impacts whatsoever. Otherwise, impacts would need to be factored into cumulative assessment of the whole project. And this eliminates the weighing of ESD as an argumentative factor and increases transparency, certainty, and accountability, uh, ensuring environmental consideration is at the core of the decision-making process. As Professor Samuel said in the final report, uh, cumulative impacts on species, ecosystems and regions are underestimated and the assessment of impacts under the Act is done mostly without consideration of future projects. And Professor Samuel describes how this sets the Act up to facilitate ongoing decline as opposed to promoting sustainability 
And while I presented my findings on 74A in a submission to the interim report of the review, the final report unfortunately doesn't refer to 74A or split referrals at all. Uh, but what it does do is discuss and criticise decision making and the implementation of ESD, uh, which leads us back to my first method of reform. Retaining the key question of consistency with objects, but changing the objects themselves, and thus changing all decision making under the Act. I recommended a better reflection of ESD principles in the Act and an incorporation of earth based principles into all decision making as fundamental. And I propose to do this by amending the Act to change the overarching object of the Act to be the protection of the environment and have all remaining objects as secondary underneath that. I also proposed the first principle of ESD be reordered to place environmental concerns as the primary consideration uh, with economic, social and equitable factors as secondary. I propose this with the aim of allowing decision makers to continue to balance competing factors uh, with discretion but require obligatory and genuine consideration of environmental factors as fundamental. Now, while the final report did not propose to alter the objects as I did, it was agreeably scathing of the Act. As you can see here, I've paraphrased the key headings uh, from the beginning of the executive summary, which I think sums up the whole report quite well. When we get into a bit more detail, uh, we find the report concludes ESD is not being applied or achieved and that decision-making frameworks lack strength and transparency. The report also states how the Act enables considerable discretion in decision-making and how there is no clear link between approval decisions and the objects of the Act or the achievement of environmental outcomes. And this is something I found in the research of 74A. Now, contrary to what I've argued, the report does not criticise ESD itself and instead kind of doubles down on the concept, uh, recommending it be applied and delivered rather than just considered. And in my opinion, this might not solve our issues um, as decision makers will continue to have the ability to weigh the factors of ESD and that balance I spoke about, however they see fit. But what the report does recommend that would impact decision making is instead of proposing to alter the objects of the Act as a kind of alternative or a bypassing of the objects, the report proposes its main recommendation as the implementation of these national environmental standards. And these would intend to set strong, measurable and legally enforceable standards, which place clear outcomes and limits for decision makers. This is because, as the report says, the Commonwealth has a patchy history of demonstrating that it makes and enforces decisions according to the law and in a way that achieves the objects of the Act. Patchy is certainly one way to put it, uh, as it was actually found 79% of approvals contained clerical or administrative errors or did not comply with procedural guidance. Since the report, uh, the process of implementing the National Environmental Standards has begun with the EPBC Amendment Standards and Assurance Bill 2021 awaiting its second reading in Parliament. However, the contents of this bill is not what Professor Samuel recommended in his final report. The proposed legislation has already received heavy criticism for being piecemeal legislation that does not come close to implementing what Professor Samuel recommended as part of the standards reform package. This is obviously very disappointing as the government has a real opportunity to affect the future of the Australian environment with these reforms. Uh, but as Professor Samuel predicted in his report, there will inevitably be objection to the detail of the standards and he notes, as the rules and outcomes become clearer, so too will the limits on discretion in decision making. He notes, uh, he talks about a spectrum and he notes the industry stakeholders on one side 
raise concerns about imposing limits on discretion when approving the environmental impacts of developments. And at the other end of the spectrum, he notes environmental groups advocate for uncompromising rules that prevent any, any impact to protected matters at all. Um, and this is why I advocate for an earth jurisprudence approach, a soft ecocentric approach, which I believe sits more in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, it's an approach where discretion is limited, but not taken away and impacts may still be permitted as long as they are considered properly and cumulatively. The national environmental standards have the potential to limit decision-making in this way uh, if they are appropriately implemented by the government. Uh, but whether this happens remains to be seen. Uh, I truly hope uh, enough advocacy and support for these issues of national interest can deliver better outcomes for the environment uh, while meeting Australia's future development needs sustainably. And that just about sums up my presentation today. Uh, so thank you very much for listening uh, and please feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Thank you, Tim. Would you like to stop sharing your screen? We may need to go back to it uh, briefly. Did that work? Yeah. Uh, yes, that did. Thank you very much. So I think you'll all agree that was a, Tim has prepared a really thoughtful, sophisticated paper and he put a lot of time into developing his presentation and we're very grateful for that. It's extremely timely given the Samuel review and the current Senate inquiry into the Environment Protection Standards Insurance Bill. Um, just to kick off, we've got a question that's come in and we'll come to that shortly. But please um, open the chat and drop in your questions for Tim. Um, I'd like to start, uh, Tim, if you don't mind, um, exercising the chair's prerogative, to, um, to challenge you a little bit about uh, Earth systems, the Earth jurisprudence, and how we might find common ground with those who are more sceptical about Earth, Earth um, jurisprudence. Uh, you mentioned that there are inherent problems in neoliberalism and capitalism and that putting humans at the centre of the ecological system means that we inevitably erode the environmental sustainability. Neil did put in a submission to the Senate Committee inquiry and will be giving evidence next week. Um, one of the recommendations we made was that um, there'd be far greater focus in a public education campaign or a stakeholder education campaign about the new policy towards national environmental accounts. So using your example of the Olympic Dam, for example, if one was to, to, to using the language of neoliberalism, perhaps, um, the new market environmentalism, if we were to attribute economic value to the myriad values of environmental systems, such as um, the ecotourism benefit, the um, ecosystem function across those very vast migratory bird um, uh, journeys and the different ecosystems they come through, the, the value of totemic species to indigenous communities if they were to be quantified and all the externalities about environmental waste and how we process it and store it, et cetera, the costs of that. If we were to use to speak to, to policymakers in the language that is dominant in, in current discourse, you know, do you think that there might be more of a meeting of minds rather, you know, if we use the language of earth jurisprudence, might it be dismissed as, you know, greeny, unrealistic, idealistic, Whereas if there's better environmental accounting for every attribute of ecosystem service, ecosystem function, ecosystem intrinsic value, that we might have a better consensus across the different stakeholder groups who, who value um, outcomes. So that's my question for you. Yeah, I think um, you've definitely got to be careful on the language used. Um, when approaching these issues with 
uh, whichever party you're approaching them with, um, especially the government. Um, but yeah, I guess it would just have to be maybe a slight watering down of, of some of the language I use there, like earth community and these things. But I think the principles themselves um, are definitely still um, understandable by all and, and can be appreciated by all, um, especially when viewed in the broader context of what's happening in the world. Um, obviously with climate change um, as an ever-growing issue and gaining some steam in America and around the world with Biden and, and, all, and all these things. Um, I think it's becoming easier and easier to see that movement starting to happen um, because it is inevitable uh, with emissions and with climate change. So I think um, when viewed in that, in that context, um, it's a lot more understandable. Um, but yeah, in the, in the, the narrow context of um, what you're saying, I think, yeah, maybe just pick, pick your words, but um, the principles behind it, I think, are strong. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I might just also refer um, attendees today to appeal to work. Um, the Australian Panel of Experts on Environmental Law gave a lot of thought to the principles that should be inherent in any reformed environmental law. And if you just Google appeal.org.au, you'll see a number of principles, um, not dissimilar to what Tim is arguing for, but additional principles like um, sustainable innovation and best practice and, and so on. There's different, uh, there's um, principles, outcomes, directing principles, uh, etc. So please um, have a quick look at the appeal recommendations not all of which were picked up in the Samuel Review, but some were. Um, but thank you, Tim, for that, um, for that answer. Now, we have a question from Bradley Corgan. Bradley, would you like to put on your video and ask that directly, or would you like me to ask it for you via the chat? Uh, I have no problem with you reading the question, and I can uh, no, no, explain. You're, you're, we see you now. Hello, Bradley. Hello. Would you ask your question, please? Sure. Um, what you are talking about as cumulative impacts in California, and I'm also I'm licensed both uh, in the Northern Territory and in California, um, cumulative impacts is a little bit different. And we would call what you're referring to as cumulative impacts as piecemealing or segmentation. And I'm wondering if you considered piecemealing jurisdiction under the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, which goes, actually maybe a little simpler in that it goes to a statutory definition of what the action is or what the project is. No, Bradley, I haven't actually heard of uh, the piecemealing in California. Um, it's certainly something we'll have to look into. So you're saying it's similar to cumulative impacts here? Yeah. Uh, well, well, piecemealing, I guess the, the approach is a fairly simple one. You can't chop up a larger project in order to evade the environmental impacts or analysis of the environmental impacts um, of, that, of that larger project. So there's some court tests in California uh, when the, whether, whether the future act under consideration, the test is going to be whether future expansion is going to be a reasonably foreseeable consequence of what is actually under consideration. And it looks like I just froze. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what you just said is exactly, is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, that when you're splitting up these projects like BHP did, uh, they were accused of gaming the system, um, essentially, um, to avoid referral by splitting up that project. So yeah, any way to avoid that um, is obviously positive lost me all together there. Um, it sounds like the, uh, Tim might look at this as part of a PhD project if he <laughs> further, further develops this uh, research. Maybe. Well, piecemealing jurisdiction in California is pretty well developed going back, gosh, almost 35 years now. Yeah. And I will, I will send through a, a, the, uh, the citation on, this, on what's referred to as the seminal case. Thank you, that would be great. That's great. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Ms. Watson, uh, Sophie, or I guess, uh, Ms. Watson anyway. Um, would you like to ask your question or would you like it relayed? 
you turn on your video. I can try, but my internet's not great. That's okay. I, uh, I can try. Let me know if my uh, internet yes, box is you. working from home. It's um. Okay. So if, um, about 10 years ago, I uh, heard about the EU making a decision, and I don't know which court it was in, but it was about um, that projects cannot be split up into separate EIAs to be considered for approvals. I was just wondering whether you've heard of that and whether that's filtered down at all into Australia. I haven't heard of that decision as well. Um, but looking at what you've just said, um, I think with what I'm talking about and 74A, it's more about splitting the referrals up in that first instance than splitting up the assessments um, for approval. Um, because what happens when they split up at the referral stage is they don't even get assessed. So it's not like there's separate assessments happening. It's just some parts of that project are not getting assessed at all. Um, Sorry, can I just jump in there? This it yeah. also included the screening stage. So the screening okay. for whether or not the EIA went ahead, which I guess you know, is kind of similar to this referral. Yeah, stage. I'll definitely have to look into that as well. Um, Cause as we know, there hasn't been much in Australia, so. It's probably time to start looking at California and, and the EU and these places. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I do encourage attendees to look at the EPLJ article because Tim's research was extraordinarily uh, broad and he looked at departmental manuals, at the legislation, at um, policy guidelines and it was really a, a wonderfully researched and beautifully argued paper um, so I do encourage you to go and look at that. Um, I guess what we're hearing from attendees is it, these comparative questions that show um, how much our EPBC Act needs to be brought up to international best practice that we're really yet again a bit of a laggard in our um, environmental governance. Uh, okay, so Tim uh, Bradley, thank you very much for that. I don't think you can um, save chat, so if people want to capture that uh, reference that Bradley's kindly shared, the Union of California 19, 1988-47-Cal3B-376, um, please copy and paste out of the chat box into an email um, that would enable you to retain that question and comment. So thank you again, Bradley. Um, can we have some other questions from attendees, please? If you'd like to ask him a question. We've got about 10 minutes left. I have another one if no one else has any questions. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Um, Tim, it's not exactly on your topic, but it's the forward, the forward process now. Do you know what the timeline is for the EPC Act review recommendations to be implemented and then ended up in some sort of changes to the Act? In terms of the standards? No, not exactly. It's hard to say with um, Parliament at the moment because they're so COVID-focused. Um, but it's, yeah, awaiting its second reading. So I'm assuming that'll take a number of months to um, discuss those changes to that bill um, and whether that gets passed, it probably will um, sometime later this year maybe. Um, but the bill itself, as I said, um, is criticised because it doesn't actually implement any of the standards uh, Professor Samuel raised in the report. It sort of just sets up mechanisms to implement them in future. Um, so when you look at it that way, it's probably going to be a matter of years before any standards actually come into play. Um, and what those standards are, we still don't know. Um, so how much it continues to get watered down over months and years to come is, um, is yeah, hard to say. Yeah, I, I'll just re comment also in addition to that, that many stakeholders on the sustainability side of the um, debate are arguing that the government has cherry picked some recommendations and that they shouldn't be taking this piecemeal approach, that there should be a really detailed, careful consideration of this 20 um, year review of a really fundamental consolidation of our environmental law and engage with stakeholders about 
the recommendations rather than implementing the devolution to the state's approval process under standards that are non-reviewable for the first two years um, and that really do nothing more than repeat sections in the current legislation. So it would be an enormous missed opportunity should this bill proceed in the absence of a detailed government response to the entire review. You know, why commission such a, um, a detailed review if there isn't a government response prior to the introduction of amending legislation? So um, if you look at the uh, submissions that were released um, in response to the Senate inquiry um, just several days back, you'll see um, where stakeholders are lining up. And I'll be pleased to let you know that NILA, the Law Council of Australia and the EDO, all of whom I think are peak, peak bodies for, the, for environmental law, we're all making similar comments. We didn't cooperate in our submission drafting, but we're expressing similar views. We all express very grave reservations about the bill as currently introduced. Okay, Mary, would you like to uh, would you like to um, share your comment? Uh, some people... Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Um, so I'm not a lawyer. I work in um, impact assessment and state government in Tasmania, um, and there were some draft standards circulated, uh, but I don't know where they came from and I don't know where you can find them now, uh, but they were sort of passed around for people to look at. Uh, so I reckon you'd be able to find them through a web search somehow. Um, and I would be really interested to hear a lawyer's point of view um, because they were certainly, though it was very hard to figure out what, if anything, they would require of someone um, making an assessment against them. Hey, Tim? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, I couldn't actually find like any content um, of the standards they were intending to draft. Um, so I'll have another look. Um, but yeah, I would also love to hear um, a lawyer's perspective. I'm not a lawyer just yet, um, but yeah, not too long. Yeah, Mary, if I could just comment, those standards were, um, you know, the language of leaking, but they were circulated to stakeholders. Um, they're an outcomes-based approach, so they're not prescriptive in terms of the actions that state governments are required to take, and that's deliberate, so it's an outcomes-based approach. Um, the states will have discretion as to how to implement them, um, some states, you'll see there's submissions from WA and ACT on the Senate Committee website. Um, from the ACT, there's a concern that it's not clear how compliance can be assessed with those new standards. Um, there needs to be more detailed discussion amongst governments is um, what's communicated to the Senate Committee. And um, like you say, uh, you know, the vagueness, the amorphousness of the standards as proposed is a concern. Um, so a lot more needs to be done. As Tim said, Professor Samuel recommended that the, the national environmental standards be the centrepiece of the reforms and that they be enforced and enforceable and compliance audited in a rigorous way by, an, by the um, Office of Compliance and Enforcement, and that a, a environmental assurance commissioner assess whether those standards are being implemented appropriately. And many submissions have argued that um, the commissioner as proposed doesn't have guaranteed resourcing, doesn't have appropriate powers, can't audit state decision-making processes, but there are really fundamental concerns being expressed about the, the bill proposals as they are, and the standards aren't readily available. Um, they're not able to be challenged. They're not able to be disallowed by the parliament for the first two years. Um, so it's, it's again, um, missing an opportunity for reform. And I see that um, Ms. Watson has asked, does anyone know where to find a copy of these leaked draft standards? 
So if anyone is willing to share them, by all means, please chime in. Um, if you email Neela after this excellent webinar, then we'll um, share them with people. Uh, we'll send them to all the attendees. Um, yeah. I think there may be, um, through the Senate committee process, some more transparency around those proposed standards, given the centrality of that recommendation in the Senate Review Report. But let's hope that Tim's recommendations are considered further, that we, we don't permit the breaking up of um, impact assessment processes and that there is a comprehensive assessment of all cumulative impacts so that there can be a better uh, decision-making process with more limited ministerial discretion. So it's now four minutes to go. Does anyone have a final question or we shall close the webinar? And I'll just remind people while you're thinking of your question that we will be uploading the webinar to our YouTube channel. And so if you have colleagues who are interested in this issue, uh, please encourage them to access it there. Feel free to share the link to uh, Bradley's uh, to Tim's slides, and um, and also uh, you know consider looking at some of the references that um, you, you've popped in for the uh, from Claire. Uh, Claire, do you want to before we shut? Um, do you close? Do you want to just um, share your comment? Do you want to unmute and put your video on quickly? Hi, Hannah. Um, look, I was just responding to um, Bradley's earlier comments around um, the consideration of piecemeal applications. Um, and so I've just um, sent a link there to a High Court decision, which um, uh, I guess most of the planning environment lawyers would be very the one of um, Pioneer Concrete. Um, but as far as I'm aware, it's the Wilderness Society um, case was the only one that has considered Section 74A in any detail. Um, and as far as I'm aware, um, the Pioneer Concrete decision hasn't been considered in the context of the EPBC Act. So, um, yeah, it's just a comment. Okay, so this recent decision of the Wilderness Society and Minister of the Environment, yes. um, can you explain how they approached Section 74? I suspect that came down after Tim's uh, paper. Oh, no, that, that was the one that he referenced um, in his research, I understand, um, oh, right, okay. if I'm to understand it correctly. Is that right, Tim? Um, yeah, that was the only um, case I could find that discussed it, and he didn't actually discuss it um, in terms of its sort of content or application. It was just whether the minister should have considered it at all, like what I spoke about, the, um, the duty to consider. It didn't actually discuss um, yeah, much content, so it wasn't too helpful. <laughs> That's right. I mean, um, so I was involved in that case and that was the only, you know, there wasn't any other precedents that we could look at. Um, and I think probably part of the reason is that, yeah, there isn't a like, great deal of content to, um, to that section. <laughs> so it was just simply that they had overlooked even looking at, um, you know, whether they needed to call in the whole of the project um, at all was that that was the only basis upon which um, that decision could be challenged. Um, yeah, not not the decision not to call in the the second part of the the action. So, thanks. Right. Yeah, okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, um, we have a very generous offer to email the standards. So, um, what I'm suggesting is that they be emailed to Neela Board Members at gmail.com and we will uh, circulate them to attendees. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for that off generous offer. Um, so if there are no more questions, it's right on the hour. I'd just like to thank Tim again for this excellent webinar. And I encourage you to have a look at the Neela website to see the other events that are upcoming. For Western Australian residents, there's an in-person event uh, next week, I think, on May the 6th, um, or the week, shortly the week after, um, on, on the new climate policy in WA with um, very eminent uh, senior speakers. So I encourage you to have a look at that event. And if you're there, please attend. I encourage you to attend. 
Um, otherwise, um, also please consider getting involved in the NILA advocacy uh, and submission writing, and please encourage your colleagues to uh, put their papers into the essay comp. I'd also just like to mention that nominations close for the um, uh, National Young Environmental Lawyer of the Year Award that the Law Council runs. Uh, that's presented annually at the uh, Marla Perlman Oration at the Federal Court in Sydney in August. So if you know young environmental lawyers who are doing uh, sterling work, please ask them to nominate. Okay, so thank you everyone. I'm going to close the webinar now and thank you again, Tim. Uh, you can uh, you can exp um, put up hand reactions. There we are. If everyone would like to either put up a you know a hand clapping or unmute and give him a clap, he's you know given that he's just started a new job, he was very very kind to continue with this uh, presentation. So thank you everyone. Oh, here you are. You've got lots of claps coming in. Thanks, Anna. Thank thanks everyone. everyone for coming. And okay. Thanks for, uh, All right. Have a good questions. day. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again, Tim and Katie. See you Thanks all everyone, everyone at the next webinar, hopefully. Okay, bye. Bye.